coded targets are one of, if not the best, least used tool available to someone doing photogrammetry. My main goal when it comes to photogrammetry is variable reduction. By reducing variables, we can achieve levels of automation that are typically only found in more enterprise solutions. The more variables you have, the less you can automate. Some examples of variables may be the scale of the object or the rotation of the object relative to the world that it sits in. For example, you don't want to scan a building and have that building end up at a 90 degree slant or a 102 degree slant. By using coded targets, we can get rid of any uncertainty when it comes to the scale, rotation, or even orientation of that object. Further variables that you could reduce could be things such as the size of the intended scan area. You could place down coded targets intended to be defining the outer borders of a bounding box to be used for reconstruction. By using coded targets and scale bars at capture time, we can reduce the number of overall variables contained within our scene significantly. So in this two-part video series, I'm hoping to teach you everything you need to know about coded targets, scale bars, and how these simple tools can help you automate, quality check, and structure your data sets in the most effective way possible. So let's jump into part one. What are coded targets and scale bars? So to begin this, first we're going to need to understand the tool that we're going to be using to scale our photogrammetry alignment, and that is the coded target. This is going to be a very simplified explanation. However, I hope it conveys uh, at least the basics behind what it is and why we use them. So a coded target is a black and white pattern. It's visually similar to a QR code in most cases. There are different target types and we'll briefly cover that later. So coded markers come in two main varieties that we use for photogrammetry. Now for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to be talking exclusively about April tags later. However, circular coded targets exist. They are used primarily in a lot of commercial applications and they've got a lot of legacy with applications like uh, Argisoft Metashape. However, these days I find it best to use April tags. They're supported by almost everything and the April tag system or ecosystem behind it is available on a BSD license so you can use it commercially. Anyway, let's get on to it. So there are three key features with April tags that you should know about. So this largely applies also to circular targets, however there are some differences. First of all, the target family. So a target family is all targets of a given type. Uh, these are made using uh, an algorithm to generate. Now to detect these targets, we need to define what target family we are detecting. So you can only really use one target family within a data set unless you're wanting to rerun the target detection tool over and over again for every other target family that is contained within your data sets. So the April tag has a known center point. This is defined by the outer four corners of the black square and then finding the intersection point between those four corners. Coded targets are defined by the data that is contained within each one, and a family is defined by the bit depth of the target as well as the Hamming distance. For April tags, this data is stored as alternating black and white checkers within the overall black square that defines the target's shape. So first up we have the bit depth. This is defining how much data can be stored within each target. In the case of the 16H5 family, we have 16 bits of data. In the case of the 36H11 family, we have 36 bits of data. 16 bits of data can contain roughly 65,000 unique IDs. 36 bits of data can contain 68 billion unique IDs. So we've got a lot of potential data within each tag, however, we need to make these tags truly unique, and that's where the Hamming distance comes in. So that's the last part of that name. So I'm not gonna go very in depth here. 
I'll link the Wikipedia article below, uh, but for the context of this video, we're exclusively looking at how hamming distance is applied to the targets and nothing else. So the hamming distance in this case is the process of taking our ridiculously large number of unique IDs and culling them down to a point where they're visually unique because computationally unique or unique within a string of uh, zeros and ones is not the same as being unique on paper. And since we are visually looking at these targets using a camera, we need to make sure that there is no way one target can be identified as another target. And Hamming distance allows us to do that to a very high degree of accuracy, where no target can be assumed to be another target. And false positive prevention is critical to getting good scale and good data. If we've got false positives and we don't know about them, then we've got a problem on our hands. So let's look at it this way. If we've got the Hamming distance of one, changing a single point on an April tag will make that tag invalid. However, if we were to change two particular points, so say turning one square to black and another square to white, would be valid. So that's now a unique tag in the context of Hamming distance one. Now, if we bump that up to Hamming distance of five, that will mean that there has to be five unique changes before a target is valid. And this Hamming distance, this process has to be applied across every single unique ID contained within a target. Now, with a Hamming distance of five, sure, that does reduce the number of potential targets. However, what happens if we rotate a target? Then that is now considered unique. But we don't want a unique target that's rotated. So any 90 degree rotation of each target is also culled from our family. This also includes mirroring of targets, both vertically and horizontally. Now, if we look at the 16H5 family, we'll see that out of those 65,000 potential tags that we've got, now we've only got 30 valid tags within the entire family. If we look at the 36H11 family of tags, we've reduced that number from 68 billion down to just 587. That's a very large reduction, but that also means that those 587 targets are truly unique within the context of our April tag family. Now, if you look at both of these tag families, the 16H5 and the 36H11, we can see that in comparison, the 16H5 isn't very unique, uh, whereas the 36H11 tag family will be far more reliable. There'll be far less likely chance of having false positive detection. Let's just discuss false positive because where a 36H11 tag might have denser target points, we'll find that the 16H5 tag family might produce a lot more false positives in the context of noisy surfaces because since there is far fewer unique points within each tag, the chance of those unique points forming in nature, say on a noisy rock, is far greater. That fine noise, that sharp, fine noise within each image can be detected as a target and we don't want that. So I tend to always go with a vastly higher Hamming distance and bit depth tag than would theoretically be necessary for the most cases. So as we can see coded targets can be detected and placed within our photogrammetry alignment uh, with relative ease but that doesn't help us with scale position, orientation, rotation. The next step is to utilize a process called ground control points. I'm not going to explain the naming behind that. It's got a lot of legacy to it, uh, which you can find on Wikipedia as well. The gist of it is, it's the process of assigning a 3D coordinate to an unconstrained point within space. Let's break it down and I'll show you how you can control a alignment or a scene using these ground control points. Assuming we've placed a target within a scene and you've gotten a good capture of that, so you've got that point. If we were to assign that point, 3D coordinate, as an example, um, 
x0, y0, z0, then this point would be exactly at that point in space. So in this case, it would be the origin of our 3D space, 0, 0, 0. However, but that does not help us with scale, rotation, or orientation within our 3D space. There is only a single known point. Now, if we were to add a second control point to our scene, a second target that we know the coordinates of, and we place that within our scene, we get this. We get two points a known distance away from each other. We can assign the second point a new coordinate, for instance, x0, y10, z0. And now this point is, for instance, and this is way out of whack, but this point in our example is 10 centimeters away from our 0, 0, 0 point. That means that we've now constrained our scene so that these two points are exactly 10 centimeters apart. We've also constrained it to the 0, 0, 0 point of our world, and we can now point it. We can scale it, but we cannot control the rotation along our last unconstrained axis. To do this, we need to add in a third point. We've got our original point, 0, 0, 0. We've got our second point, and this one is at y10. And our last one here, we'll call it x5. We've now got three points constraining our scene down to an exact number. This means that we've got scale defined, we've got our orientation defined, and then we've also got our rotation defined because with this third point, we cannot rotate on this axis. We are completely locked down. Now this is the power of these ground control points. So let's look at practical examples of a scale bar in a production setting. Uh, as you can see here, we've got a prop rigged up and it's on a turntable. So this platform, you probably can't see it because it's black on black, but this turntable um, has a small platform and onto it, we've got a little um, clamp that is holding a scale bar. Now this scale bar is a little bit different than what we described previously. This one has an offset. So what that means is the center point is no longer in the middle of this marker here, this uh, corner marker. It's in fact five centimeters offset. So that means that if we scan an object using the scale bar and offset the scale bar physically from the center of rotation on our turntable by five centimeters, any object we scan using the scale bar will be placed in the center of our world, which adds a huge benefit when it comes to automation and just if you're automatically retopologizing your objects, this helps massively because you no longer have to assume you need to translate an object from an arbitrary location into the middle of your world. It's now already there. Now, as you can see, since the scale bar is unique in that it's got an offset, this also means that the coded targets that exist on the scale bar are also unique. These aren't seen in any of my other scale bars. And that's the magic of having so many possible targets available to you. You can build unique scale bars for individual applications. And with you know busy studio workflows, sometimes that's really important. It also means that if you damage a scale bar, you can throw it away and not have to worry about those particular targets cropping up again and causing issues because those targets don't exist anymore physically. And that means that also when we detect these scale bars, we don't have to worry about detecting markers that don't exist anymore. So now let's talk about detecting these coded targets in software. So, how do we use these points? Every photogrammetry package has different workflows. Zephyr, Metashape, and Reality Capture all do things differently. So I'll be a little vague here as this video is long enough as is. But in essence, you select the target family that you used within your data set and run the auto detection tool, which should spit out all found targets as control points. It's best to set a minimum number of detected targets that qualify for control point placement, as this will help prevent false positives. 
So in conclusion, coded targets add known data points within a data set that can be easily found and used later. So furthermore, these coded targets are very open in their creative potential. There is no immediate barrier to stop you from either developing a tool which uses this data further or even just creatively uses the data within your photogrammetry package of choice. And the use of coded targets for scale and transformation and rotation control with the use of scale bars is incredible. They're very easy and efficient to use both at capture time and when you're back in the studio. So I should probably end it here. Uh, this video has gone on long enough. I did not expect it to be this long. Seriously, I planned for eight minutes and here we are probably 15 minutes later. Now, I've got a part two coming soon. Uh, if you're watching this in the future, you can find it immediately. But for now, uh, you can like this video and subscribe. I'm hoping to release a lot more content in the future. I've had a few personal issues over the past two years which have very much hindered my ability to make these videos. So yeah, I've, I've got a lot of videos planned. I've got a lot of scripts written. This one was actually meant to be filmed and released in, I think, mid 2020, uh, but that has been delayed significantly. But yeah, thank you very much for watching.